Hello there, welcome to Seeing Clearly with Charlotte Giblin. Now, uncharacteristically, this has actually taken me a few goes to get started. And normally, and if you've watched any of my videos before, I'm really proud of the fact that I do everything in one take, it's unscripted, it's part of my deliberate attempt to remove all of the glitz and glamour and polish that we see so often now, and just bring it, everything right back to the reality of real time and and being able to take our time with forming conversations, with formulating ideas, finding the right words. But normally I'm extremely good at just that stream of consciousness uh, monologue because I, I go over these subjects so often, all of the things that I talk about, I think about a great deal and the paintings that I'm discussing carry a huge amount of resonance and and as soon as I have the painting in front of me, the words come and the stories flow. I'm a storyteller and I'm sharing the stories of my life and my art because I know that they're universal stories and have, can have a really powerful impact when, when shared. The importance of knowing that you're not alone and some of the issues that you might be struggling with or have struggled with are shared by other people. Maybe it's because of the subject matter that this one has created a few stumbling blocks for me because it's about masks and the reason why we have masks. And here, the story within this painting is the early stages of me removing the masks, actually no, finding the courage to look behind the masks and understand why I was wearing these different disguises and looking at the real Charlotte behind those disguises in an attempt to change the way I felt about myself and the experiences that I was having within my life. I was, for the first time, taking real responsibility for my responses, my reactions, actually addressing all of those negative feelings that I had buried behind these masks. So the irony being, now that most of my work is about removing any illusion and, and exposing the real version of myself that's inside, that I actually found myself faltering with this, this whole subject. Maybe I'm being particularly reflective as well because of the time of year. I'm filming this in between Christmas and New Year. Very much a family time for a lot of people, for me too. And in these family groups, we can find ourselves reverting to older versions of ourselves. Uh, we, we almost slot back into behavioural patterns, don't we? Well, I can only speak for myself. I often revert back to old behavioural patterns and look around at the, the people in the, in the group and sometimes I wonder if I'm the only one who's evolved at all. And of course, we all are evolving, but some of us at different speeds, some of us have different needs and wants within our personal evolution and our, our journeys. And I do find myself reflecting, it's not in a dwelling too much on all the negative things in the past, because I don't think that is necessarily helpful, not after I've spent a lot of time bringing all of those experiences up, looking at them, addressing them, and then working out what I can do to move on in a much more positive way and create actual positive, lasting personal change, which I've, which I've done. And so when I look at this version of myself, it's really quite strange because I don't recognise that person anymore. The, the changes that I've implemented have been that dramatic that it's both encouraging, but also really depressing and alarming in some ways that I was even at this stage as a 40-year-old. So this was painted in 2015, eight years ago. And if you saw my video about 
how I ruined my art career with the, the painting of myself climbing out of the, the frame. This is, you'll probably recognize the style. You might even recognize the outfit. This is from the same emerging series when I realized that there was this version, this frightened uh, and yet determined version of myself who was hiding inside that I really needed to address because she was making me feel really uncomfortable a lot of the time. The voice, that voice was getting louder and louder and manifesting in all kinds of physical ailments, a great deal of sore throats. My immune system was impacted enormously. I had a you know, bad stomach a lot of the time, and clenched jaw, headaches, you know, all of the associated symptoms that we, we understand are to do with holding things in. And that has been part of my life uh, ever since I was, was a child. The, the idea of making sure that everybody else was okay before my own needs were met. Taking responsibility for other people before I would take responsibility for myself. I know that I'm not the only one who has played that role. If you saw the video about uh, my mum, the portrait of my mum, you will understand that I adopted a, very much a role of emotional carer. My mum has anorexia and also suffered from quite severe mood swings, part of the, the symptom of the, the disease, the anorexia and the mental, all the mental health issues that come with that. And I found myself able to be the positive force to, I wanted to make sure that everybody else was, was well cared for because I felt that I could really look after myself, that I had this in, inner wellspring, I've called it many times, this, this joy, this energy, which would surge up from inside whenever I needed to be rescued or saved, then I would have this incredible internal force make everything okay. But I felt really bad about that. And, and I developed all of these different layers and masks to fit in and cope with what I saw reflected in the world around me. And again, not unusual. Don't we all want to fit in? It's a matter of social survival, especially in a in a family unit, if we feel that we are unusual or are, there are some really personal specific challenges where we feel that we can't voice our, our true self, then we clamp it all in and find other ways to express that version of ourselves or we bury it. And this is what I did. I had the, if we think about the onion, which I mean, it is a great analogy, isn't it? Because we can picture the, the layers of the onion. There was the, the default setting of Charlotte, the, the happy, joyful, uh, wellspring version of myself, which was right at the core of everything. And then I had all of these anxieties and fears layered very thickly over the top with finding, trying to find my place in the world, uh, seeing people's reactions towards me and having to moderate my behavior as a result, being really careful that I didn't hurt anyone's feelings or tiptoeing around so nobody would, would feel offended. This is a really relevant point for now, isn't it, where we've become almost hypersensitive to other people's feelings, forgetting that we are all individually responsible for how we react and respond to what is said to us. And that has been the biggest part of my journey, was taking full responsibility for how I reacted to other people and trying to trust that if I could find a way of expressing myself and behaving that really did fill me with, with joy and felt good all the way through, then it couldn't be bad for the people around me. And if they reacted in a negative way, 
I couldn't control that, just as they couldn't control how I was reacting to them. But that is the hardest lesson for some people to learn. I was talking to my partner Pete about this uh, in preparation for doing this, this film, and, and I was writing down just a couple of, of thoughts, and one of them was, you know, my, um, the fear I've had for such a long time of making other people feel uncomfortable. And he said, God, what's the problem with that? Bleep, bleep, bleep them. You know, <laughs> and, and I thought, well, great. I'm really pleased that you've never had that problem. Although I know that he has. Of course, he worries what other people think of him. Or he did anyway. That's, it's like a total fallacy that we all just breeze through life not caring what other people think about us. And if we do have that reaction, I think that's another mask and another shield trying to protect us from the, the soft, vulnerable, sensitive self that's inside and doesn't want to be hurt. The, the frightened child definitely a frightened child there, uh, terrified about what, what is going to happen if I allow my true self to, to come out, if I really address the root cause of all of the fears that we're keeping her in the dark. Um, I mean, it's a very powerful image there that for me, because it, it's so, it really illustrates how I, I felt. And you don't need to paint all of your fears and all of your stories to be able to address them but it's just how I have it helped to manifest my own uh, recovery create that that journey by seeing first of all I'd have the images of in my mind of what I wanted to paint and then I would see them on the canvas or the plywood board in this case and and realize oh my goodness this is this is real, this is serious, and she needs to be listened to. So I had my inner joy, and then I had all my anxieties and fears and just life stuff and how to cope and how to pay the bills and, and what do people think of me and would I ever find true love and you know, all of those things that you, that you worry about and, and am I good enough? And then on the outside of that, and this is a mask that I think everybody is familiar with. You have your happy coping mask, which hides all of this, which is often very socially inappropriate, or we feel that we can't allow this version of ourselves to come out because we want to put forward our best self all of the time, our most positive self, say yes to everything because we don't want to miss out on anything. We don't want to appear to be in any way negative or, or bringing the atmosphere down and affecting other people, being inconvenient. And that's another really big, powerful thread that's gone all the way through my life, not wanting to inconvenience people because that would challenge my identity as the, the responsible saviour of, oh, the ego is just spectacular. But of course, that comes with a huge layer of insecurity there. And not recognising that while I was desperately trying to make everybody else's life better and save everybody else, I was neglecting myself, the only person I could ever possibly attempt to save. And that's really difficult for us to take on board as well, especially when we have people around us, family members who we feel really connected to, whether they're children, parents, siblings, uh, partners. We want their lives to be wonderful. We want to save them from pain. And realising that we can only exert a little bit of influence, we don't actually have control over anybody else's decision making, just as nobody has absolute control over your decision making. That's very challenging to accept. And taking that spotlight back to myself and recognising that if I was actively going to do anything positive and make any kind of a concerted effort to change the world or save anybody else, I had to start really looking at what was making me ill and holding me back. And 
she was a big part of the story. Now, back in 2015, I was, yeah, I was turning 40, or I'd turned 40, and I, I don't think the age is necessarily relevant because we all evolve at different, different times. And I think what I found incredibly disillusioning was that it took me that long to recognise that there was a, a very key part of me that I wasn't addressing and a very frightened part of me that I wasn't allowing out considering that I had this image of myself and this identity and professionally I was incredibly capable and I had lots of friends and and the the inner joy of, of myself my identity my real core Charlotte would just burst out all the time pass through all of the anxiety and and that was the version that people were drawn to and that everybody could see but what I found was that consistently the the fears that I was having were tr really tripping me up and as I said earlier starting to make me ill consistently ill and I had to really take a deep breath to look beyond that mask of constant coping and always being there for other people to ask myself well, actually, what's wrong? Where is this coming from? And at the time, I was having real doubts about my, my relationship and with, with my partner and wondering whether New Zealand was the right place for me. I'd been in New Zealand for six years at that time, six or seven years. And I was questioning a lot of my decisions but what I had bypassed in those earlier shallow questions was how much of the decision making was my responsibility. And of course, most of it. I had chosen to keep a lot of my fears, a lot of my concerns to myself. I learnt not to express them, not to make a fuss because there have been so many people around me as I was growing up who really needed help and did make a fuss. And, and so I just learned to, to cope and put my, my needs second. And that is not in a, in a role as a mother. That is just in a, the nurturing role that I took on board with, with everybody. That is how I have been incredibly eternal through my entire life without being a, a mother and in the strictest sense. And this version of myself, this frightened version who was afraid of uh, conflict, afraid of pushing too many buttons because I'd been surrounded by people who, who lost their temper and that made me very frightened. And so I'd learnt to tread on eggshells just to keep the peace, a real people pleaser and or oh, my antenna for any kind of danger or um, a change in the emotional atmosphere was so sharp. You know, I could, I could feel it at a hundred paces, like, oh my goodness, this person has not had a good day, right? Quick, smooth everything out, calm the waters because I don't want to set them off. And so this person, this person within me became terrified of any kind of conflict. And I think because I was afraid of what I would say, I thought if I take the lid off, if I become the person who doesn't hold back, like so many of the people who'd surrounded me and didn't hold back and said what they wanted to and said really wounding things to me that I just absorbed, but I would never... I never wanted to be that person who lost it. I had learned a really tight control because so many of the people around me didn't appear to have that kind of control and I knew how much it hurt. So I wanted to be the controlled person who just never hurt anybody's feelings. And maybe that worked for a certain period of time, except I was destroying myself 
from the inside by containing all of this anger and resentment and fear. And the paintings that started emerging at that time were such stark, clear illustrations of what was happening and who, who needed to come out. And when these were shown in my studio, I was in the, the Coromandel in, in New Zealand at the time, and all of the work, the rest of the work I was doing was very colourful, very lively. And suddenly these quite alarming depictions of, of the artist were emerging and, and people didn't really know how to take it because it, it's, it's such a stark contrast to the, the mask that I, I was wearing. And I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Masks are really important. They can be really important as protection, creating a, a sense of confidence when we, we feel that we're lacking it. I mean, why do so many people get dressed up and go to fancy dress so often? Because you can be a different version of yourself. You can allow a different character to, to come out. But at root, this is such a fascinating subject to delve into as to why we need to make ourselves look different to allow another version of ourselves to come out. We, we, we've learnt that we can't behave in certain ways or we think that we can't behave in, in certain ways when we are just the, the normal presentable face that we put out to the world. And I've become absolutely fascinated by this whole subject and there will be many more explorations of, of masks and identity through, through my, my videos because at root, this is the key to every form of, of personal trans, transformation, any kind of evolution, to recognise why you're burying certain aspects of yourself or only allowing them out at, at certain times. And for me, exploring why this person within me was so afraid of stepping out of the shadows and, and saying the, the wrong thing. And it was completely wrapped up with that role of my, that I'd adopted. Nobody forced it on me. I adopted this role as a very young child of taking responsibility for the well-being of others, making sure other people were their emotional needs were met ahead of mine. And understanding how that role, although it might feel magnanimous or seem like a wonderful way to behave and make sure everyone else is, is okay before yourself, actually, if I can only control what happens to me and if my life experience is contained in this flesh sack, <laughs> then if I'm lying on the floor, uh, keeled over, ill, constantly in pain, physical, mental pain because of this role, what's the point in that? I've Not only have I not helps anybody else because anybody who cares about me would want me to be well, would want me to be thriving. So not only have I failed there, but I've also completely failed myself. So recognising that was absolutely pivotal in this journey of discovery and opening up those, some of those layers removing some of the masks and having the courage to actually look inside and understand where those roles were coming from and then what on earth I was going to do about it. And the, the succinct version, because of course real change takes an awfully long time and I think that's one of my reasons for rebelling against all of the fast editing and the, the quick conversations and the 30 second videos that are so prevalent at the moment that if you're actually serious about making any changes and improving your your life it really does take a long time and that's terribly boring but it's it's the fact of of the matter and we're led to believe that a quick fix is is real and our it's it's not we we think that we can put plasters over over the surface but if you really want to exert any kind of influence over the, the negative reactions that you're feeling and making some changes, 
it, it really does take a long time. And and it became the the foundation story for the, the book Seeing Clearly, which these videos are, are derived from, of allowing myself to enjoy the journey of change, which I knew was going to take a very long time, which started with these paintings and started with allowing this fearful version of myself to, to, to come out and, and so I could understand why she was there. And the baby steps to change, to greater change, are, are the important parts because we see the end result or we see where we think we want to go. And I have been guilty my whole life of wanting to be there by next Tuesday. And and you realise that actually you've just got to take small steps and sometimes you're going backwards and sometimes you're going sideways and then days you'll have huge leaps forwards. But it's um, convincing our, our muscles, convincing all of the, our cells that we have actually started to change the way we think and the way we behave takes a really long time. And the first time that I started making changes, the time when this Charlotte started saying no to things or actually re replying back to somebody in a way that they weren't expecting or which was uncharacteristic for me and challenging people's perception of, of who Charlotte Giblin is and what my identity is was. Once I discovered that not only were the people around me quite pleased to see that I was, I was being a little bit more uh, affirmative and, and making decisions or saying things which clearly had, had me at the forefront, not only were these people quite pleased, well, they certainly didn't run to the hills screaming and never want to see me again. And that gave me a little bit more confidence. So gradually, very slowly over a period of time, I would start, you know, shoulders went down, chin went out, head up. It was a case of learning by act action by taking responsibility and not just the, the way I was thinking about myself and wanting to make change through imagining it, but creating actual actions in the real world by saying things differently. And it, it was terrifying at the start because I, I thought my whole world was going to come crumbling around me. I, there's a scene at, towards the end of The Truman Show which devastated me for <laughs> months when I saw it, where uh, Jim Carrey's character, the, the boat pierces the, the wall of the world that has been created for him. And the disillusionment that he experiences absolutely destroyed me. And the reason for that was because I felt disillusionment was the most powerful reaction that could possibly affect us, that disappointment. And I desperately didn't want to disappoint people. I didn't want to create any sense of disillusionment where people felt that I'd been a fake version of myself or that I'd created this scenery, this set, which, which wasn't real. And we have all of these different versions of ourselves which are real. And you never have to address any of those different versions if they all make you feel good. But I was not accepting the fact that some of these versions of myself really were causing, I was allowing them to cause a great deal of damage. And it's those negative reactions within us that are very, very helpful to address. Now, I know that these are personal stories, but they're incredibly universal at the same time. And the point of me sharing these and, and showing images of my work, and by the way, all of these images are on my website where you can zoom in and you can see them more closely and look at them without me gesticulating in front of them. And I know that the visual can help explain or bring something to light 
in a way that words can't. And I really hope that by sharing my stories, you get a, an opportunity to reflect your own path and see where your experience is different, where you maybe have moved on much more quickly than I did. And then you can congratulate yourself on your, on your developments. Or maybe you recognise in my tale the behaviour of somebody close to you and it'll give you a, a different view on their, their behaviour. Now, there are going to be many more themed videos around this subject because it identity and the masks that we wear, the especially in the face of all of the social media, the Instagram filters, everything fast and flashy, even more important to understand why we're hiding versions of ourselves, why we don't feel that they're good enough to display to the world and what we're afraid of happening if we do actually allow those layers of ourselves to be exposed and to come out. So much food for thought and I hope that you've got some new ideas to mull over. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.